back with a special guest and we've got a special announcement as well with some uh, new parts for JP843. Uh, in the spirit of collaboration, they came from one of the partners that we work with very much and uh, our special guest is from the company as well. This is Darcy Barker. He's the Chief Engineer of Heritage Maintenance with the KF Centre for Excellence. Welcome, Darcy. Thanks, Ian. It's good to be with you today. So jumping right into it, uh, wing pins. You were here a couple of weeks ago and you dropped off some uh, Hawker Typhoon wing pins. Did you want to uh, maybe touch base or, or talk a little bit on what these were all about and how it transpired? Yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, nice to come see your facility and, and to finally meet you in person. We've talked uh, for quite a few years now, but uh, I've never ever got to do it in person. So we have obviously a, a common goal which is a, a flying typhoon and a flying Hawker Tempest uh, Mark II in our case. And uh, commonality uh, between our two aircraft are some of the wing pins, the pins that hold the wings to the cockpit section of the aircraft. And so when we made ours, uh, it would have been wasteful of us to not uh, make uh, enough pins for you as well. So I think you could talk better, Ian, because I haven't been with the program for the the whole time. We've been working on our Tempest MW376 now about eight years, and I've been with the program for about three. So you, in the very beginning, contacted one of our people, Brian Kerluke, and you guys hatched a plan to share uh, information, to share whatever we had to share uh, in exchange for some manufacturing commonalities between our two aircraft. Right. Yeah, it was actually, uh, it was pretty interesting. It actually really goes back before the Tempest even came to Canada. I was really excited to see that it was going to be sold. Unfortunately, there was some pretty um, sad circumstances around the sale, but I, I try to track all the big hawkers that have commonality with Typhoon parts and uh, try and work with people as much as I can. And I was delighted to see that it was coming not only to Canada, but into Kelowna. Um, so making contact with uh, KF Aerospace at the time, uh, Brian and I started working on some metallurgy with wing pins and some of the conversion uh, requirements for some of the steels in this structure, specifically these wing pins. And it was agreed that uh, uh, a set of pins would be made for the Typhoon as well. And that's because the, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Darcy, the, the Tempest 2, there's in both aircraft, there's eight main wing pins that hold the wings to the fuselage. In the Hawker Tempest 2, four of those are the same as all eight of the Typhoon's one, Typhoon pins. Is that right? That is correct. So the, the loading primarily going through the front spar, um, the, the new wing that the Tempest got, uh, the new laminar flow wing, uh, got two, or pardon me, four, two per side, big pins. And so the rear spar pins on our aircraft remain the same, which are common to all eight positions of the Typhoon. So when we were manufacturing, uh, once the machine's in running and once those uh, lathes and mills are doing their thing, producing more parts isn't the complexity. Uh, all the work came long before that, as you alluded to, the metallurgy and the fitment of the parts and reverse engineering parts. We were fortunate enough to receive some unusable but genuine uh, wing pins from some friends in the UK. So we were able from there to back up the metallurgy and the hardness and and all of the different metallurgical properties that were required. So like I say, all that work we were doing anyways. So to have the machine spit out some more parts is really the, you know, it can be said to be the easiest part of the operation. Well, and that's a, a, a bit of an issue for us too, because these pins, well, they seem fairly simple. It's quite complex and it's really not something that we'd want to try and take on in our own facility. Pins and bushings, I, I should say. These are pin sets with a a wing pin, three bushings, a special washer, nut, and a cotter pin, I believe. Um, did you want to mention anything about the complexity of uh, some of the machine work on this, Darcy? Yeah, the complexity comes in with fitting the pin. Yeah, we speak of them as pins, but you're absolutely correct. It's, it's an assembly. It's a pin set. So the, a tapered pin passing through uh, a plug end on the cockpit section or fuselage and passing through another plug end on the wing. So there's three separate lugs, three separate bushings, yet a single pin. So these tapered bushings need to be able to be positioned in their respective fittings in the right place and have the pin inserted into them and have 
an absolute minimum of 80% contact through each and every one of those individually placed bushings. That's where the complexity came in. How, how do you make these things so that they fit with 80%, a minimum of 80% contact? And it took a while. Uh, some computerized measuring equipment, uh, a lot of consternation by our quality control people and some back and forth between our machinists and the quality control. But uh, we ultimately got there. We made a few sets before we got it right. Uh, not always do the drawings, which we do have, give you the data you need. The drawing essentially says, okay, this is the part you're going to create. But way back when these parts were being made, the shop that was making them had their local process or their individual process, and they often retained that information, and it was never put back to Hawker so that the drawing could be updated or a drawing change notice could be produced. So you have a drawing, you know what it's supposed to be, you know what you have to do in the end, but you don't know how to get there. And so there comes the reverse engineering of the pins. And that's an interesting thing too. Uh, we've found, because almost every one of the Hawker Typhoons was actually produced by Gloucester, we found that there's Gloucester modifications and they were approved by Hawker, but they were separate to the Hawker information that we'd find. So there's a lot of different detail floating around out there that needs to be sourced and put together like pieces of a puzzle to produce part. Yeah, absolutely. Sourced, or if not able to be sourced, you get to provide it on your own. That's and right. that's where the complexity <laughs> came in. Yeah. Little investigative work there. Absolutely. So, and the, the wing pins, they really stretched from, uh, I think, 2014 when the Tempest came in to just recently when you were uh, visiting the shop here. And in the meantime, uh, we've been doing quite a bit of work with uh, the KF uh, Center for Excellence. And um, uh, it, it's shown in a couple different ways. One of the other projects that we did, uh, KF came in Darcy specifically, I think it was the first project that we worked on together, came to the rescue with the uh, propeller spider for the Rolls-Royce Merlin 3 that we we're working on. That was a really unique spider because it we could use Hamilton standard components for the propeller on that, but the Merlin 3 had a British spline on it and we really needed a specific spider to get that done. Thankfully, the guys over at the Bomber Command Museum had one and we were able to make a trade to acquire it, um, but it was a ground running condition, one that still needed a bit of work. And uh, the work was again beyond our capabilities, but Darcy stepped up to the plate and really bailed us out on that one. Um, quite a bit of work was done to that. Darcy, could you run us through the procedure on what you guys had to do with that uh, that spider? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, it's it's always wonderful to be able to help. You know, you you work day after day after day, and you know, MW three seventy six behind us. It's been going on for eight years, and yeah. and and sometimes you sort of get lost in you know the day to day activities, and you don't know when you're going to finish. So when the phone rings, and 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 you get a convenient distraction which you were, and thank you very much for, for uh, asking for help and involving us. But uh, our, our company, KF Aerospace, and, and you know the, this, this specific company, the KF uh, Aerospace Center for Excellence that, that I work at now, I've uh, been around you know, well over 50 years. And so we have shops that are very, very well positioned. A propeller spider is a piece of high strength steel, and it's really not any different than a landing gear leg or any other uh, aviation grade high strength steel. So we process that part the same way we're very, very familiar and used to processing parts. So your part came in, got some cleaning. It uh, immediately would go for a, a stress relief bake. Uh, after any part, any high strength steel part comes out of an oven, we want to crack check it right then and there. If it isn't cracked already, it's going to crack. If, if it's going to crack, it's going to crack when it comes out of the oven. After the uh, NDT, no problems we had. It went for some corrosion blending. And then we decided to shot peen the part. Shot peening is a process that we use to relieve surface tensions on the part. And because we did a bunch of blending, that blending can impart tension into the surface of the material. The shot peening removes it. After that, uh, we have a full CAD plate shop. So the part went in for low hydrogen and brittlement uh, CAD plating. And because we did that, it went back into an oven to make sure that... Uh, we baked out all of the hydrogen and brittlement from the part back to NDT uh, and then into a box and, and off to you. And I'll tell you, it, it was a real thrill to see, for me, it was a real thrill to watch uh, your YouTube channel and, and watch that engine fire up, knowing that we had a little piece to play in it. And uh, it, it's, you know, the, the, the collaboration, the reason what we're talking today 
it, uh, it's oftentimes more exciting to help somebody else than it is to do the daily things, as I alluded to earlier, the daily grind. It's, it's nice sometimes to interrupt it and, and, and see the fruits of your labor help somebody else. Because I know in the end what that Merlin 3 was designed to do. It was a very strategic play on your part. And I'll let you talk more about that. Or I know you already have. but uh. Yeah, well, that was a means to the end. We actually got, uh, I wouldn't say flack about it, but we lost a bit of our following because we had switched from really progressing quite quickly on the monocoque section for the Typhoon into all of a sudden picking up this Rolls-Royce Merlin engine and focusing all of our efforts and all of our time on that. Um, but we, we really needed to make sure the deal was going to come through. And ultimately, it paid off in the fact that we've got a Napier Sabre 7 behind us to start working with on our Sabre program. So it uh, it was, I think, three years overall of work. So that uh, making noise with the engine was a big thing, but having the whirly bits up front was a big thing too. So that uh, propeller spider was gold to us. So thank you very much on that one. Oh, you're welcome. Call anytime. Yeah. <laughs> Careful what you wish for there. Um, okay. So uh, a couple other things, I guess uh, one main other thing here that we worked on, we had a bit of an issue with some material um, and it was for the monocoque section behind me here, uh, trying to ramp up as the Merlin was leaving, actually trying to ramp up and get back into some of the structural work on the monocoque to get that out the door. There's four uh, main Langeron sections that I would call them. I believe Hawker refers to them as stiffeners. They're common between the Tempest and the Typhoon. Uh, they run between frame A and uh, frame C, the two forward-most frames, and they really help carry the load or transition the load from the cockpit into the monocoque structure. Um, they're made of a 80 thou material, and because of the, the tight shape of them, um, we've got some special dies and a bunch of equipment here. Actually, Pyrotech Aerospace donated some equipment to us to help with that. Uh, but the material itself, I could only find on the east coast of the United States. And we needed maybe a half sheet of this stuff and they wouldn't even ship a full sheet because it's soft and there's potential for damage. So um, the only way we could get it from them was to buy, I think it was three or four sheets and we'd be into it thousands of dollars and uh, a couple thousand in shipping, I'm sure. And the price would add up and then we'd get our little pieces of material for making these four components. Um, so I called Darcy and asked if there's any chance that they had any in their their stores and sure enough, there, there it was. Uh, do you remember finding that one, Darcy? Yeah, we did. It, it was neat. Again, another convenient distraction. So thanks again. And we, it was about the time that we were just wrapping up the sliding hood and, and the jettison system for the sliding hood. So it was, it was, it was good timing on your part because we were, we were, our heads were in that game, in that sliding hood game at the moment. But yeah, eighty thou. Uh, uh, was it T three in or was it T six? Twenty twenty four T three. I don't recall now the, the grade. Of, yeah, it was in old condition anyways. And so back into the back, 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 back of our sheet metal rack. And, and lo and behold, we pull out a, a full sheet and a partial sheet covered in dust. And, and the markings on it were old, but still legible. And, and we've got a pretty good filing system at Flightcraft as well. So we were able to, uh, or KF Aerospace. Uh, so we were able to pull out the original certs and uh, get that metal off to you. What kind of made it fun for me is uh, we still fly Converse. We still fly Converse every single day. So we ran this sheet metal out to the daily Convair. Uh, so a Convair 580 flew out of Kelowna down to Vancouver on the daily sked. And we had the guys down in Vancouver pull it from one Convair and load it up into our stretch Convair, which flies to uh, Victoria every day. And, and uh, you took it from there. So it's kind of neat. There's a lot of people. We say collaboration. We're talking about that today. So many people involved just to move a piece of metal, uh, you know, a couple hours away from here. And uh, so we're so thankful to have so many people that are willing to help us. Yeah, it's pretty impressive the amount of people that make this kind of thing happen. That's a really good example of it. The, the whole supply chain really got involved in that one. And uh, we even had Martin Chernoff here, uh, one of our team members down in Victoria, who works at the airport and had a ramp pass. He met the aircraft and grabbed the material and then uh, brought it back up here for us. So. It's, it's important to note that it's not just the people that you see on camera or discussing the projects, but there's literally hundreds of other people that are uh, contributing to the success of these kind of aircraft. Yeah, and in, in, in large ways and sometimes in small, but it's all important. We can't do this by ourselves. No, no one group, KF Aerospace cannot, Typhoon Legacy cannot, none of the groups can. And so it, uh, it takes a community to do this. And, 
And I think that's a, I know it's a big part of your job and, and it's a big part of our job is building those relationships and, and learning who you can work with and, uh, and, uh, and moving forward because as I said, not a one of us are going to do this on our own.